Melanie, I'm super eager to explore the Enneagram today and, and dive into some of the beautiful information in this book that you co-wrote, especially how it might help with mental and emotional blocks as well as the creative process. So firstly, I thought it would be really useful if you could give us a brief explanation of what the Enneagram is. And I know that you kind of mention at the start of the book, the moment when you're eating tofu and rice and you first <laughs> discover the Enneagram, but I'd love to get a sense of, of that moment when you first discover it and it entered into your own life. Sure. So the Enneagram is a system of personality and it has deep roots, both in spirituality and in psychology. These are often thought of as two separate disciplines, but the Enneagram brings them together because it's looking both at what motivates people and how people can grow. And it looks at growth from the perspective of the day to day, but also looking at it a bit more deeply than something like the Myers-Briggs might because it's all about motivation. There are nine Enneagram types and they're based on our core motivations why we do the things we do. And the more you learn about the system, the more you learn about different people as you study the system, the more depth you discover. I was fortunate to run into the Enneagram when I was studying in university in my first year. You mentioned my little story. I was at a table with friends talking about personality types and a workshop that we'd just had in class about the Myers-Briggs typology. One of my friends at the table, while I was eating undercooked rice and tofu, said, I've learned about this system called the Enneagram. I think you'd like it. And he gave a bit more detail. We went around the table. He had thoughts about what the personality types were, gave little bite-sized summaries. From there, I read his books about the Enneagram, which were Riso and Hudson's books, the Wisdom of the Enneagram and Personality Types. Those were two of the leading teachers in the field. And this was a wake-up call for me because I was fairly young, first year of university, living on my own for the first time and discovering myself, discovering what sort of life I wanted to live independently. And the Enneagram gave me a tool at that point to navigate this time of uncertainty. It showed me more about myself. It showed me more about other people. And I remember the moment when I first used what I learned about the Enneagram to question what I was feeling. I'll get into this more later. I tend to be a fairly emotionally driven person. And I can also be a bit socially anxious. There was a party that I was invited to that night I was looking at my friend and thinking, I don't really want to go to this party. But then I thought about what I learned about my personality and thought feelings aren't facts. My, actually, what I thought was my feelings are not manifest destiny. That was the realization I had at that moment. I thought I'm feeling really nervous about this party. But as a matter of fact, I don't know what's going to happen. Why don't I go? Maybe I'll have a good time. And I did. That's such a brilliant example, Melanie, this idea that an uncomfortable feeling, you said manifest destiny, like it's not a prophecy, it doesn't necessarily right. mean it's going to happen. And I love how the Enneagram enabled you to kind of step back and have that perspective so that you could question the feelings. Because I mean, let's face it, most of us are in a relationship with our feelings where they're sort of like calling all the shots and leading the show. Some are, some aren't. And we can get into that a bit more with the Enneagram. Yeah, perfect. And also, for me, you mentioned that idea that each type, it really helps you understand the motivation. And I think whenever I dive back into the Enneagram, that always really, really helps to find out this idea of, of what that desire is, what I'm motivated to achieve, but also the different strategies that my type is going to utilize to, to achieve those desires. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious because I know that you're a writer as well. You've written this nonfiction book, but you've also written fiction. You've written poetry. You've got a young adult novel out at the moment. So how has your understanding of the, of the Enneagram personally impacted 
your writing journey and your creative process? Well, I was very fortunate that it gave me an opportunity to write a book about the Enneagram. When I was teaching about the Enneagram with another Riso Hudson certified teacher, Casey Berghoff, we were giving workshops. And in order to try to attract clients and get interest, I created a little free ebook and put it on our website, put it in my bio and my email. And I was emailing some potential editing clients. One of them was a publisher who got back to me saying, we're looking for an Enneagram book. I like your free ebook. Would you and Casey be interested in writing one? So that was an incredible opportunity and learning experience. And it did make it easier to kind of know what I was getting into with future publishers and how the editing process worked. So creatively, it was a doorway. And when you were first discovering the Enneagram and you started to teach it, you were obviously learning more and more about your own type. Because I think for me, the more I dive back in, the more I learn, the more layers I, you know, the sort of Mm. the deeper I go. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey of discovering your type like did you know straight away I'm sort of on the fence about mine so did you know Mm. straight away has has your did you think it was one and then did you decide on another how did that journey go well I was looking at a couple of them starting out and I read a whole book before being clear on it I read The Wisdom of the Enneagram, I think it was, by Riso and Hudson. So I wanted to make sure I was going in depth and really looking at the subtleties. It's easy to just read one sentence descriptions or one paragraph descriptions of the Enneagram types on the internet or to hear some of the teacher's names for them and to think, oh, maybe I'm this one or maybe I'm that one. Or perhaps you'll identify strongly with one of them. And if you don't really know more about them, if you're just going off of one name or a brief description, it can be easy to get it wrong. For example, type two was one of the ones I was considering, which is often referred to as the helper. And these are people who are motivated by interpersonal relationships and by wanting to help others and have these connections. Now, In a lot of societies, that is a role often expected of women. So it's not uncommon for women or people who are socialized as female to think, oh, that sounds like me, the helper type two. But actually what's going on in your heart and in your head is motivated by something different. But this idea of being a helper is kind of a societal and cultural role that we're expected to embody. I'll tell you what that makes me think of, Melanie, is the difference between really discovering your type free of societal conditioning. So how often does that come up where someone's exploring the Enneagram and they realize there's another truer version of themselves beneath that conditioning? So their sort of facade Mm. is one type, but their true self is another type? Oh, quite often. Sometimes people will believe that one type is their Enneagram type and they'll identify with it for years. Even teachers of the Enneagram have had that happen before where they'll identify with one and realize years down the line that actually another one rings more truly. Or sometimes just moving from the stereotypes to learning more in a workshop or in a book and working with the material yourself, you'll see more about what motivates you. And when it comes to, because we've got the motivation and we've got each type having a different motivation. Mm. I have to say now I'm super reluctant to kind of give a wash, a sort of brief description of all the types, because what you said really resonated with me in terms of if we hear a brief description, we can sort of think, oh, that's Mm. me. But we actually have to go deeper and have a more thorough description. So let me kind of, let me, mm-hmm. let me see what you think. Do you think it's useful to give a brief description of all the types? 
I think it's a good starting point if you are interested in learning the material. And when friends come to me and are curious about how the Enneagram works, often they do want to hear what are the types, what are they like, and we'll start off with little sound bites. And then if they want to learn more, I'll point them to places where they can learn more. Sometimes it takes a while to find your type, but other Mm -hmm. times people's first impressions are accurate and they might hear one word say oh that's me out of the nine and then years down the line it's still that same type is still showing them deeper and deeper insights about themselves okay well let's go for it then let's let's go across and let's explore each of the types if you don't mind taking us through them sure so i'm going to take out my copy of the book here and In it, in the modern Enneagram, I wrote about what the types are seeking as I wrote the little profiles. So we'll start with type one, which I described as seeking integrity. So these are the people in the world who have strong principles. They have a desire for goodness. They like to imagine how the world could be instead of how it is, how it could be improved. And they could have all different types of visions of that, but they are striving for that ideal. And when they're... I have to say that one, the seeking integrity aspect really did resonate with me. But mm-hmm. then as I kept reading the types, I was like, okay, one's one's resonating even more than that. But yeah, the mm-hmm. seeking integrity, I thought, and actually, I really like the way you describe each of them as seeking something that that felt very useful. Thank anyway, you. carry on. So yeah, type one seeking integrity and at their best, they can embody a balanced example and Mm. basically show us what it means to live a principled life. And most of the time, so with the Enneagram, it shows us at our best and it also shows us kind of the traps that we can fall into when we're not having our best days. And even when we're having our worst days, that's one of the interesting things about the system is it shows the best we can be and also the challenges we can have and the most we can struggle. So some of the pitfalls for one can be perfectionism or being overly rigid in seeking that ideal. But you've got to remember that all of us are seeking something that's wonderful and that's at the bottom of this motivation, no matter how we're playing that out in our everyday life. I actually also really like making that distinction between the healthy expression of the type the healthy expression of seeking that motivation and when it slips out of balance Mm -hmm. because i think it really it it helps enable that self-acceptance to be like oh you know the, the reason that i'm feeling so so in the grip of perfectionism tendencies right now is because i've slipped out of balance rather than sort of thinking well i'm a perfectionist i'm stuck with this personality Mm -hmm. trait and there's nothing i can do about it Yes. Brilliant. So that's number one. What about type two? Type two, seeking connection. So we touched on that a little before. These are the people in the world who are seeking for love and appreciation. And at their best, they're able to be unconditionally loving, accepting of other people in an active way. This isn't people who are just sitting there. This is people who are reaching out and connecting actively and supporting actively. And one of, but when they're not at their best, the empathy that can be so easy can go into focusing on other people's needs at the expense of our own. Mm-hmm. And Giving to get can be one of the challenges rather than giving selflessly. But it all comes from that same place of seeking that connection and being attuned to the interpersonal dynamic between people. I thought that was really interesting, that one, when I read about when you slip into the unhealthy representation of that seeking connection. Because it actually did make Mm -hmm. me think of writers, because I think there are some writers and it is that motivation for connection that makes them want to write it's sort of like let me share my words with you let me share my experiences and i hope that that we're going to connect through this storytelling Mm -hmm. and so when i heard about that unhealthy aspect i did think of course if we slip out of balance with this um and we can become i think there's a there's a bit where you say we can sort of become exhausted because we're tending to other people yes we're we're sort of so busy thinking about other people's needs and i think that is a pattern that i do see some writers 
falling into. So again, it really made me understand like, oh, the more we know about our type, the more when we're in those periods of not writing or feeling like we've got blocks, the more we can be like, ah, have I slipped into the unhealthy aspect of my type? Yeah, there are nine types of writers, right? Just like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay, so that was type two, seeking connection. What about type three? Type three is seeking value. So if you think of an exemplary person, someone who is shining from within, who is valuable, who is bringing value into the world, whether they're the best basketball player or whether they're the CEO, the groundbreaking business person in whatever discipline, this is someone who's excelling, this is someone who's adaptable, and this is someone who can inspire others. And when I'm healthy as a three, I'm authentic in this value. I'm true to myself. But when I'm out of balance, then I will be adapting to other people without even realizing I'm doing it. I'll be trying to be what they value. Maybe I'll be trying to be the best of whatever my parents wanted instead of what I wanted. Maybe I can be overly adaptable and perform instead of being true to myself. Or maybe I'll be out there overworking and burning myself out. Yeah. And if we think about the writers who are type three, I think there's a phrase in your book also where you explain that the unhealthy version of those threes is going to seek success at all costs. Yes. You mentioned the burning out. Sometimes, sometimes being dishonest can be the less savory part of that too. Yeah. And also... If they're shining and sort of being that authentic version, that's great. You know, that's mm -hmm. where we sort of see that writer's voice on the page and we're yes. like, oh, this is just blowing me away. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as we slip into that place where we're sort of writing to fit in and please others mm -hmm. or we're trying to get published or we're trying to have that success at all costs, it's going to really impact the writing process, I would imagine. Yes. And it can be harder to write authentically when you're being a chameleon. Exactly. And then it's it's almost like to me with that one, because I really think of that three, you, you talk about them shining. Mm -hmm. So if they're being a chameleon, it's like no one can see them then. They can't right. see them shining. Yeah, they might see something that looks shiny, but is it really them? And also with all of these types, Melanie, you talk about what they do in safe situations. So mm -hmm. you talk about what happens when they're getting a bit stressed out. But I thought that was really interesting because the threes in a safe situation, they're going to let their anxieties show. They're going mm -hmm. to wonder if they're good enough. And that mm -hmm. seems to me to be less exhausting because they're less having to sort of have this perfect veneer of I'm this amazing, authentic self. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm seeking value, but actually they can sort of show their more vulnerable self as well, which I think is really important for writing. Yes, absolutely. OK, so that was number three, seeking value. What about type fours? Type four is seeking identity. So this is people who are motivated by the desire to know themselves. They're attuned to their subjective world and willing to dive deeply into the depths of their emotions. So this can be very creative in a personal way. You're sharing the beauty that you find in your inner world with the outer world when you're at your best. And this tends to be a sensitive personality type so if I'm at my best, then that's a strength. But when I'm out of balance, it can be easy to get wrapped up in my feelings and seek whatever emotions can bring me that sense of intensity and bring me that sense of being someone. And negative comparisons are one of the big ones and negative feelings also. It can be easy to get stuck. It can be easy to become self-indulgent and unproductive. And this is my type on the Enneagram, by the way, so I'm very familiar with all of that. I have to say there was a way that you were describing this that I thought this is really flowing off the tongue for her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm curious because it strikes me that this is a very creative type. Do we find more type four? Do we find more writers being type fours than any of the other types? 
Uh, there are many type four writers, and mm. because this is a type that tends to be focused on subjectivity, they'll often want to be some type of artist in whatever artistic talent they have or creative talent they have, whatever medium they find for expressing themselves can be very attractive to these people. Yeah, and I, f for the for the type four, when I was reading it, I was thinking, yeah, there are some aspects of this that really resonated with me too. Mm -hmm. Certainly the whole idea about being sensitive, being really attuned to feelings, being very empathetic. I think the, um, I've, I've written down here, unhealthy fours can become emotionally unstable while yes. trying to preserve their identity and can grow frozen, self-hating and unable mm -hmm. to function. And I was like, oh yeah, I, I, that can mm -hmm. happen to me. Mm -hmm. But then I started to read about the type five and I thought that one also resonates. So my understanding is you, you have the main type, but then you have the wing. Uh, yes, and different teachers will disagree on whether wings exist or whether they work, whether you know, how they work. <laughs> okay, because I was trying to figure out, I feel like I've got elements of both and I couldn't figure mm -hmm. out if type four was my main element and I had a little bit of a, a, a wing on, a, a five wing, or whether five was my main element and I had a little bit of the four on the wing. So if we're looking at four or five here, look at thinking versus feeling and what tends to drive you the most strongly. Do you tend to, for fours, it's very much about the world of the emotions and for fives, it's very much about the world of thoughts and wanting to discover things, to have that clarity, that illumination. I think this goes back to the comment that I said at the beginning, which is we might think or discover we're a certain type, but perhaps the more healing work we do, we then slip into a, into a different type. Because I think for me, Melanie, most of my life, I was just a head, completely mm. detached from my body. All of the emphasis was on my brain, on my mm. intellect, on my thoughts. And as I've really done a lot of work, on my healing, certainly as I've discovered ecstatic dance, chakra yoga and breath work, I've really started to come into my body. So I sort of feel that I might have been more of a five, but I'm perhaps growing into a four as I start to prioritize feelings over my thinking. Does that, does that make sense? It's interesting what you say here about the body because we're, we talk in the book about the different centers of intelligence. I mentioned thinking versus feeling. Some types, the two, three, and four are all what we call the feeling types or types in the feeling center where their motivations come from the heart, basically. And type five is one of the head types or the thinking types or the, think, the head center, and they're more involved with what's going on in the head. But both four and five tend to be more weakest when it comes to what's going on in the body or the gut center of intelligence. So for both, if you're a five or a four, then what's going to be pivotal for you and for becoming more aware and present in the world is getting in touch with your body. So that sounds great. Mm, that's so interesting to hear that, that even the fours have that weaker connection with the body. It, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's life changing. The more time I spend focusing just on the sensation in my body versus listening to the story that my mind wants to tell me about the sensation, mm -hmm. it's been hugely groundbreaking. Okay, we can come back to that, but I want to make sure that we go through all of the types. So let's, mm -hmm. let's come on to type five now, which we've sort of just touched on. Type five, seeking clarity. So these are the people who are seeking knowledge, seeking insight, they're perceptive, they can bring together ideas or generate new ones. And if you think about a lot of the great discoveries in the world, you might think, oh, that's so obvious, but it's it wasn't obvious until someone had that insight. And True. healthy fives are very original and 
they can move humanity forward with what they're able to observe because they are observing they're open-minded and on a regular day they're still going to be curious people still going to be focused on the mind but they can be overly focused on the mind on having what russ hudson that my enneagram teacher called a mental tinker toy where instead of engaging directly with that felt sense of reality you're making a mental model of it and not engaging with the world Ooh, that's interesting see i very much relate to that i I certainly related to the hyper focus aspect that can happen with fives, but I love what you just said that actually I've got this mental version of reality that that's this tinker toy rather than actually being connected with reality as it is. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's kind of pushing me closer towards thinking that I'm a five. Yeah. So some of the challenges can be engaging in the external world and becoming more isolated and thinking can become more agitated or extreme, or even you might start poking people trying to get a rise out of them. Mm, That's interesting. I think for me, that is why nature has become so important to me because it's it's really the one thing that can help bring me out of myself without being too much because I've often been really lost in an inner world and Mm -hmm. I have found that when people say you know hello is there anybody there that really aggravates me and I almost sort of want to go even deeper into myself because I just I just want to piss them off because they've pissed me off whereas Mm -hmm. nature has such a soft way of enticing my attention back outward is is there anything about nature and, and and type fives that you've come across not specifically aside from the fact that if I'm a five I'm observing all the time and that includes observing nature mm. and again the the grounding grounding practices are recommended for all the withdrawn types four and five and we'll look at type nine later as well these are the types who tend to be the most out of touch with what's going on in the body with embodied reality and getting in touch with that and getting Mm. grounded in the world is super helpful oh that's interesting to know and also i think there's an aspect of when the fives are feeling safe Mm -hmm. they feel safe to reveal their pushy side and that's that's again that was something that i really resonated with that unless i do feel safe i don't want people to see that i can be a bit bossy or a bit demanding or a bit mm-hmm. pushy but it is something that I enjoy I it's sort of a relief to get to reveal it when I can yeah brilliant so that's type five take us on to type six type six I call seeking guidance so at my best if I'm a six I connect with others from a sense of trust I can trust in others I can trust in myself as well and I'm one of the most committed loyal people on the Enneagram I'm a strong team builder I'm a great ally so this is a type who tends to have that collective mindset we're all in this together we're all on the same level we're all a team so if I'm a leader I lead from that place of collaboration and teamwork and I'm extremely courageous when I'm healthy I can recognize when I'm being called towards a mission, towards something higher, and I bring that sense of loyalty and determination to see it through. Now, when I'm kind of having an average day or even struggling a bit more, I start worrying about what could go wrong. Instead of having that trust, I'm looking for that trust. I'm looking for that sense of guidance externally. Now, am I going to find it outside of myself? Not necessarily because it comes from within. So that's a challenge for type six. I'm still committed, but I might be committing or over committing or overworking for something outside of myself. And I might be listening to different voices in my head and have this inner committee. Oh, what would my teacher think? Oh, what would my dad think? Oh, but then my professor says this other thing. This My favorite author says this other thing. So it can be easy to go round and round and round and question yourself and become suspicious or paranoid. 
But then once I get in touch with my own sense of guidance, my own inner inner GPS, then I can tap into the courage instead of the worry. And again, this one really had me thinking of writers and some Mm -hmm. of the common struggles because... It might be that we start a creative project and we feel a real sense of trust in it. And then when that trust disappears, for me, knowing that that could just be, oh, well, we're type six and we've fallen into an unhealthy expression of our desires and our motivation versus a bit like what you said Mm -hmm. earlier, it's not manifest destiny. Like if Mm -hmm. that trust is lost, it doesn't mean that the whole project's gonna fail. It Mm -hmm. means that you've lost connection with your inner GPS, as you say. Yes. And we all have all nine types within us. So you're probably listening to this and you're going to relate a bit to all of them. They're they're all parts of what it means to be you. And it's just which one is running the show for you. Which one, when you work on it, is going to help you grow. I'm glad that you mentioned that, actually, Melanie, because I think there were aspects of every single type that I resonated with. Yep. Um, Certainly the sort of, the strategy that happens when type six loses that sense of trust. Like for Mm. me, if if I'm feeling, for me, it's a sense of feeling disconnected to that, to that truth of my, of, of, of what I'm here to do, the mission that I came here to fulfill. When I lose connection with that, I do then start relying on external sources. I will mm-hmm. certainly start watching more YouTube videos, I'll start yeah. listening to more podcasts, and then I kind of get an information overload. Yeah. Super helpful. Okay, what about type seven? Type seven is seeking freedom. So I'm motivated by the pursuit of what's possible. And I can be a really fun person to be around because I have a lot of different interests. I'm open to trying new things. And even the simplest things can become an adventure when I'm at my best. I bring spontaneity. I bring a sense of joy to life. I'm inspired. And I can try my hand at a bunch of different things. Here we could see some jacks of all trades, for example are people who can bring multiple disciplines together and create a new one. They have a lot of ideas. So I'm very adventurous. Even when, even on an average day, I'll still be adventurous. I'll still be interested in variety, but I might be running around anticipating the next thing and the next thing instead of enjoying whatever I'm doing right now. And I might become a novelty junkie because I'm looking for that high because I'm not in the moment. And that can cause anxiety to go up. That can cause me to take on too much. I can even start to feel cynical. Oh, I've done all the things on my bucket list, but what did that get me? What's next? You know, unfulfilled, start becoming a bit more demanding, and I'm running away from whatever might cause me pain, responsibility. But when I'm at my best, I am able to tap into that internal sense of being in the moment, like we all are at our best, is really when we're in the moment when we're present with our experience and as a seven then I can be more focused and still have that sense of freedom and possibility and create it for others. Mm, This again had me thinking of some writer struggles that I come across I would say and I'd love to hear your thought on this the writer who's constantly starting new projects. Yes (laughs) definitely have had people like that who I've worked with. Yeah. And also when you talk about the, when they're in that unhealthy aspect of seeking freedom, they're going to do all they can to avoid pain. Mm -hmm. So it sort of speaks to me that we, we could fall into a pattern of like loving the thrill of a new writing project and wanting to avoid the pain of hitting a bit of a block with our writing or hitting Mm -hmm. a bit of a a boring part in our plot or not really knowing the way forward. So we just think, oh, I want to avoid the pain of this. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to go on on a new adventure and start a new writing project. Exactly. And you don't have to be a seven to fall into that trap with a writing project. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so that's seven seeking freedom. What about type eight? Type eight seeking power. And these are the people you might get a bunch of powerful people in the room, but then you ask them, well, why do you want power? And many of them will give you a reason. A type eight will just look at you and be like, well, 
well, well, because I do. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. And these are people who you often will notice when they walk into a room. The term executive presence could describe this type of person really well. I have a certain presence about me and I have an impact. I'm here. I'm when I'm at my best, I have a lot of gusto and energy. I can enjoy a good risk and I can act with wide reaching impact. I'm not afraid to go out there and do things. I'm very self confident. I'm a natural leader. I speak my mind. I take action. I'm courageous and I'm open hearted. I'm able to use my strengths for good in the world and protect others, keep an eye, uplift people. And when I'm kind of having an average day, then I can be going overboard with that innate power rather than being grounded in it. I feel like I have to be strong. I have to put on my armor to put on my shell. So I'll, I'm no longer comfortable letting people see my vulnerability. And I start to think that the rest of the world is like me. You know, it's a dog eat dog world. People are tough. You've got to be tough in order to you know, win the fight. So I'm going to do everything I can think of to stay in control, whether it's ethical or not, uh, whether it's destructive or not. And you could even have someone who's actively managing businesses who's an eight because they're still out there doing active things, but not necessarily from a healthy place. But then when I am at a healthy place is when I'm able to connect with that softer side of myself as well and acknowledge it and connect with my heart. Yeah, the eight's so interesting because as you write in the book, when they are feeling safe, they do feel able to reveal their neediness. Yes. So, I, you know, I love that because it isn't a sense of like everything about me is powerful. There has to mm. be that, that balance. And it also made me think of the writer who feels like they have to do everything on their own. They've got to figure mm. out all of their problems on their own and they can't actually reach out and say, you know, I'm, having a, I'm having a little bit of a, a struggle. Mm. How, what would, how would you see a, a writer who's a type eight, what sort of struggles would you see them having or what kinds of blocks would you see them dealing with? Well, Ernest Heming Hemingway is a was a writer who was a type 8, and he ran into some issues with living large, I would say. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So how that's interesting that there's been a writer. Obviously, he didn't do an Enneagram test, or I'm assuming that he didn't. No, just, no been just been, you know, the Enneagram teachers go back and read biographies, and they find people who they think align with these different types to use as examples. Mm. So would you say he was like so, so busy living large that he, he sort of, that became the only side to him or, or what? I think it seems like it was self-destructive personally. Mm. Self-destructive. Yeah. Okay. That does make sense. And then finally the type nine. Type 9, Seeking Harmony. So we move into quite a different place from where we just were with Type 8. Mm. These are the peacemakers of the world who can see how all aspects of life are interconnected, whether it reminds me of your Substack a little where you write about nature and how everything's connected and our breath is connected to the trees. Everything creates a symbiotic whole that's balanced. And when I'm in touch with that truth, I have a sense of inner peace that I can bring to the world and I'm able to set people at ease. I create environments where everyone feels welcome. I'm reassuring. I'm genuinely nice. And if we look at the corporate world, we see a lot of type nines who will get promoted and we see some who become world leaders as well and people will vote for them because they're such a nice person and everyone feels connected to them. And they're able to relate to people. They're able to be a mediator, to connect with different perspectives, different sides of the table. Mm -hmm. So when I'm healthy, I'm able to do that. When I'm having an average day or maybe a less than average day, I will check out and I will kind of be complacent. I will go along with people. I don't want to ruffle feathers. 
I really dislike conflict and really avoid it. I go along no matter what my own needs or desires or feelings are. I often don't even realize what they are because I'm checked out. So sometimes I can become even oblivious to others in the world around me. I can become passive. Others can be frustrated with me. Uh, neglect can come into the picture in a more passive th way than we might see with some of the types that are more actively self-destructive. So what's beneficial for me as I work on grounding into my body is to cultivate assertiveness. When I find myself going along with others, I will ask, do I really not care about this or do I have an opinion that I'm not saying? So paying attention to my own desires and often that can come from a felt sense in my body. I have to say this was the final type that I felt some resonance towards that mm. real sense of, of connection, that wanting to create that calm space. And actually the the stressed place of that mm. aspect for, for the type nine, which is when calm turns to anxiety. Yes. I was like, yes, that definitely happens with me. But also when the nine is feeling safe mm -hmm. and they feel that they can adapt behavior that's a bit, that's a bit show offy. Yeah. And I was like, yes, that resonates with me too. Yeah. Mm. So yes, I'm sort of four and five are drawing my attention, mm -hmm. but I think with the nine, there's nothing about nine that makes me think, no, that doesn't apply. Mm. Whereas there are aspects of four and five that make me think mm, mm. that doesn't really, that doesn't really fit. But I would say there are some aspects of four and five that I really feel strongly mm. towards. And it's almost like with the nine, I don't feel as strongly, but they all seem to resonate. So what, mm. what advice would you give me with that situation then, Melanie? Um, keep exploring. If you know others who know the Enneagram and have worked with it and know their types, then that can be useful as well to talk mm -hmm. about and learn about their experiences. If you find videos of people who have been at workshops and have gone through the process of finding their type, that can kind of give some insight. Looking at examples of people, if you read some of the examples in the book and read about what their lives were like, what their challenges were like, these can all be insightful to see who has lived experiences you connect with. And also, when you look at the hard times in your life, when you look at what's been most challenging for you, what do other people complain about? Um, if you have other people look at the types and maybe they'll have their own ideas, sometimes people can see things that we don't always see in ourselves. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's helpful. Great. So I'd love to touch now on exploring some blocks, like mm -hmm. emotional blocks, mental blocks, because this is definitely something that we experience as writers. So how, it might be, perhaps you want to take one type as an example, mm -hmm. but how, if, if there are writers out there who are experiencing an, an emotional block or a mental block, how might knowing the Enneagram or knowing their type help them move through that? Knowing their type could help them see where the block is coming from in some cases. That mm. It can also give a broader perspective on where they're coming from in life and what, what can help to create balance in their life. And if I create balance in my life, often that can help with my writing as well. We talked about how some types bring that body awareness, the four or five and the nine being more grounded can really open things up. If we, I'll talk about two other triads now. We have the, the three, the seven and the eight tend to be more assertive, very much acting and active out in the world, but they're the least connected with what's coming from their heart, with the heart center, with their own emotions. So if you see one of these types as your primary type, doing practices to connect with your emotions, with your feelings, with your heart could help bring balance into your life. 
with the one, the two, and the six, it's connecting with your head and not just thoughts going round and round, but curiosity and clarity and things like a meditation practice that brings that clarity of mind, intellectual exploration. Those can be practices that are grounding for these types. I love this. So we've got the idea that the Enneagram not only helps us I suppose, get clear about what practices are going to be beneficial to bring us mm -hmm. back into that healthy aspect of our type, mm -hmm. but also by knowing the unhealthy or the average expression of our desire or motivation can then help us see where we, where we might be blocked. I'm thinking of types who fall into unhealthy people pleasing. And this mm -hmm. happens to me. I, often find if I'm blocked with my writing, it's because I'm focusing on writing something that people are going to like. Mm -hmm. And of course, then I get stuck because I'm like, I don't know what people are going to like. like you there's, don't. There's so many different people and there's so many different likes out there. So mm -hmm. then I just get completely tongue tied. So knowing that that's a pattern for me, I find that really helpful. But yeah. I love the idea of practices as well. So s some of us want to do grounding practices. Mm -hmm. Some of us want to do head clearing practices mm -hmm. or focusing practices. And the other thing that strikes me is if we've got nine different types of writer, that sort of advice of, well, this is, this is the creative practice that you should have, or you should be writing every day, or you should be writing in the morning, or you should be planning your novel, or you should be pantsing your novel. We actually need to know a little bit more about our type before we make these decisions of what our writing process or our creative process would be. Our type, yes, and also our personal circumstances, because there's so much to having a writing practice beyond our personality, too. What does our work schedule look like? When do we have the most energy? Are we a night person or a morning person? I have tried before to get up very early in the morning and write. It doesn't work, but in the evening, it's good. <laughs> so all those sorts of things, too. And have you found, I, I, I'm realized, you so you shared that you're type four but have you found in your own creative journey um it might be that you've had an example of something that you've worked through because of your knowledge of the enneagram or something that you've been able to put in place because of your knowledge where in your own creative journey has the enneagram really just been a beautiful support i think it's been a support in accepting how i work more mm. and being comfortable writing about that and writing from a place of honesty and recognizing that maybe there are a bunch of people out there who will connect with it. For example, in my young adult novel, Chasing Harmony, it's about a musical prodigy. That aspect is not autobiographical, but a lot of what it felt like to grow up in rural Prince Edward Island, Canada, and what it was like to and what it was like emotionally for this character, even though the facts are largely made up in this story. It's a fictional story. The, uh, there's a lot of emotional truth in that. Oh, that's super interesting. So, yeah, let's, let's go into that a little bit more because actually I was really, for me, I was interested in how we could use the Enneagram to develop deeper, more authentic characters in fiction. Mm -hmm. So I think it does perhaps help us understand characters' motivations. And I know, am I right in saying, would it be correct to say that there's a love triangle in the book? Um, Is that the best way to describe it or not? Not quite because it's asynchronous. It's more like different relationships at different points in the character's life. So it's not connected, but there's sort of two two different urges. Yes, and one one reflects on the other at a different point in life, too. So they kind of play off each other in the narrative. There are alternating timelines. I know the blur makes it sound like there might be a love triangle, but chronologically that's not exactly how it plays out, but they do influence each other. Okay, got it. So, because I think, even though you said it's a fictional story, mm -hmm. it's making me think of two things, Melanie. Firstly, it's, I think it is quite common for us to take 
a specific mm. emotional landscape from a time in our life and then yeah. want to put that at the center of a story. But often where we can struggle then is that we haven't got a really clear sense of what that emotional landscape is. We're still mm. trying to figure it out. So then we sort of end up writing a character that doesn't isn't really clear to the reader. Or what happens is we um, we sort of haven't got the full view of that entire emotional landscape. But what I'm thinking with the Enneagram, it sort of helps us fill in all the gaps of why we were feeling this and mm -hmm. how we might have been feeling this and how those feelings might have shifted from one thing to another. So how would you say that the Enneagram might have helped you really sort of fill in the gaps with your emotional experiences so that you could write about them and perhaps even the other characters sort of make them richer and more believable? Absolutely. And you mentioned creating characters who are believable based on Enneagram types. I actually have a brief article I wrote about that on a website called DIY MFA about creating realistic characters using the Enneagram. So I can email it to you if you like, so you can put it yeah. if you have liner notes or something. Yeah, we'll pop it in the link. That's brilliant. I think that's going to be so popular. So for Chasing Harmony and for my writing in general, I definitely feel like the self-exploration that I did with the Enneagram helped me to understand my life more clearly. And that did help in writing a novel and being able to imagine character arcs to other characters' lives, whether they were based on my own personal truth or not. I, mm. I do feel like it brought clarity. And I have characters where I don't necessarily start writing a character thinking of an Enneagram type, but as I write the character, sometimes a type will become clear and having that knowledge can help me flesh out that character. With Chasing Harmony, I think I probably wrote a novel about a four. <laughs> there, I also, also having done this autobiographical work of coming to terms with my own bisexuality and writing a bisexual character, and being able to put my vulnerability and that experience on the page. I think the Enneagram helped with that. Yeah, that's lovely to share because I, I, I'm not so aware of it with the four, but now I'm thinking of the eight who has that fear of exposing that vulnerability. What mm -hmm. what would you say is, is the real sense of it with a four? What's that relationship with sort of, talk, you know, telling truths or really showing the true self? How would a four feel about that? Well, um, Riso and Hudson write about a dichotomy for the four of concealing and revealing oneself at the same time. And mm. art is a very easy vehicle for you to do that. You're creating a story, in my case, or maybe a painting or a dance that expresses some of your own personal truth. But it's not just you showing yourself completely. There can be a bit of shyness but also a strong desire to express your emotional truth and fours are more withdrawn type so i have a lot of things that i've written that are sitting on my computer in the cloud and th some of them have been published some of them i would like to be published but it's easier for me to express myself than it is to go back and structure what i've written or than it is it takes initiative it takes the gut center like we were talking about to put things out into the world and that's the leap for me is to connect with the market to submit to have discipline in my writing schedule I found we talk about practices being pivotal for you as a writer one thing that's been huge for me is putting myself on a clear schedule setting clear goals and structure for myself rather than just following inspiration and emotion. Mm, that's so interesting to go deeper with that. I love that sense of that dichotomy because it can really explain why there's a certain type who's sort of drawn, the, the phrase that's coming to me is they're drawn to the analogy because it's mm -hmm. like you can put all yeah. the truth of yourself, but you can put it in an analogy. So you've got a little bit of distance, so you're revealing, but you are concealing at the same time. But I also loved what you said about the place for you is that that sort of creative self-expression comes a lot more naturally than the editing and the structuring mm -hmm. and the sort of taking the more, I don't know, business-like steps in the world. Yes. 
what an amazing gift to have the awareness around that. And I'm curious, mm -hmm. Melanie, because often, I mean, I don't know, again, how specific to type this is, the tendency can be to f see that pattern and then respond to that pattern by giving yourself a hard time. You know, why mm -hmm. am I not more like others? Why can I not put myself out there and edit like so-and-so yeah. can? So how has the Enneagram or knowing that aspect of your type helped with the way that you judge versus accept yourself? Well, it's true for all of us, but it's especially prevalent for a type four that if I'm focusing on myself, trying to understand myself, I'm comparing myself to others and I'm looking at what, mm -hmm. what brings me identity, not just through what my feelings are, but what makes me different from other people. And it's so easy for that comparison to be negative. But if we look at social media these days, we all have some of that where this person on Instagram is on holiday, they're chilling by the palm trees. Oh, why aren't why don't I have their money? Why am I not under those palm trees? It's so easy for all of us to get caught up inside that. But one thing the Enneagram provides is basically some tools to give yourself a reality check and to work on making the things that are harder for yourself easier. There are practices that you learn as you study the Enneagram deeply that support each type in a fairly individualized way. And for me as a four, bringing in structure is one of them. If I were a three, it would be like noticing my own feelings, noticing where I'm putting on a mask or adapting. There are very specific things that you can notice that can help you out in the day to day. Ooh, that's gold dust mm -hmm. that you've got a specific practice that's tailored for your type. What's the, I know you talked about nines needing grounding. Is that, is that the practice for nines, just grounding practices or is there something else? Yeah, there's, there are a bunch of them, but one that can be really helpful and Riso and Hudson call this the wake up call is noticing when you're checking out, noticing when you're not there and basically bringing yourself into the moment, noticing when you're going along. Mm. And whenever you're going along, then you can ask yourself, is this what I want or do I have an opinion I'm not saying that I'm not a need that I'm not meeting? Just it all starts with noticing whatever your type is. Yeah, and that's, for me, I think the beauty about the self-awareness piece around the Enneagram. As soon as you notice your type, mm -hmm. then you can notice where those tendencies are. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea about practices for each type. I love the idea about that blog post, the kind of DIY M MFA that you mentioned where you can mm -hmm. do the character breakdowns. I'd love to finish with one final exploration. I mean, literally, Melanie, mm. I, you know, I wish I had you for a whole other hour. I feel I'd like be happy to do another hour some other time. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to have you back for a round two. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, especially when it comes to writing, having a healthy, productive mindset for, for me has been a game changer. The difference between just sort of falling into a pit of despair or falling into a blame game versus let me take responsibility for the direction that my thoughts are going in. Mm -hmm. So for the writers out there who are like, yeah, you know, sometimes my mind does not feel like my friend. Sometimes my mind feels a very unproductive place to be. Sometimes it feels like a very negative place to be. How can the Enneagram help us cultivate a healthier, more productive mindset? Well, as I mentioned, there are specific tools for each type that you'll discover as you explore farther, but it all starts with awareness, with noticing your own behaviors day to day and noticing if there are patterns you see yourself repeating. Sometimes your friends will point them out. You might not have seen them, but other people might have seen them. There's a little story about a person who fall, walks down the road, falls into a hole. Then they walk down the road the next day, fall into a hole. Then they walk down the road the next day, but they're able to go around the hole. And that's something that the Enneagram is able to give us. It's able to show us where we fall into a hole, how we fall into a hole, how we can bring ourselves out of it. 
I love that. So really becoming aware of the habits and the practices that are causing us to fall into the hole. I think I've heard a version of that Mm -hmm. where is it that eventually the person is able to actually even just walk down an entirely different street that doesn't have a hole in it? Yes, that's it. (laughs) Okay, I was like, oh, I think I, yeah. So that's so lovely that that's actually also something that the Enneagram can create. Because to me, when I think about those habits and behaviors, they sort of feel, it's almost like a magnet. I'm sort of being drawn Mm. towards them. So even if I'm like going around the hole, it's almost like the hole's kind of like trying to pull me into it. So the idea that eventually I can sort of be across the other side of the street, like it's, Mm. it's no longer really sucking me into it. Right. It's consciousness rather than acting from a place of unconsciousness. And we can also build our skills in this through mindfulness, practicing different forms of consciousness in our daily life. Any way that we can be aware of and present in the present moment will bring us closer to our truth and our balance. Whether that's through the Enneagram, it can help in some ways. It has also has limits and things it can't do. As I've discovered, sometimes other aspects of psychology or other aspects of support are needed, but the Enneagram is one tool that in some cases can be really helpful. Mm. So yes, we'll definitely have a round two, but let's just take a moment, Melanie. I'm I'm so grateful for every bit of wisdom that you've shared today. Um, I've been wanting, like I've seen quite a few videos on the Enneagram, Mm -hmm. I've dipped into some books, but for me, it's been such a treat to actually have like a sort of one-on-one personal conversation with someone who knows it so well. So thank you. Thank you. This has been great. Let's just take a moment to reflect. Is there anything that you've kind of realized as you've been going through the Enneagram again? We've sort of been applying writers to the different types. Is there anything that you think, oh, she didn't ask me this or some kind of insight that's dropped in that you want to share? So just a final moment to reflect for you. Touching on what I said earlier, one thing that helped me was at first I was very excited about the Enneagram. As I work with it over time, I realized that it has limits and I needed to be able to access other tools for support and to move forward in my life. The Enneagram has continued to help me, but other aspects of psychology and other forms of support have been needed as well, absolutely. And that may be true for some of you as well. If we think of the Enneagram Two, the resources that we have are all written from a certain perspective. They, they can't necessarily look outside of the perspective of the people who created them. And biases can inform the material that is communicated, even if it has roots in various traditions of ancient wisdom. So be mindful of what you're learning about the Enneagram, where it's from, the biases that might be involved in the source and how it applies to the intricacies and the intersections of your own personal situation, including where you, where it has limits and where you may need other forms of support as well. Mm, thank you for sharing that because I think it's super important to see it as just an, a tool in the toolkit rather mm-hmm. than something that you're just going to completely rely on. I really yeah. have a sense of it's it's sort of what it's going to bring to a lot of the other beliefs and the practices that I already have versus, yeah, just completely putting all my mm-hmm. eggs into the Enneagram basket. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Melanie. And also, so I'm going to share the link to that post is there any other platforms? I know you're on Twitter. I know that you're on LinkedIn. I know you're on Instagram. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? So those ones, I'm on Facebook as well, and I'm on Substack. Brilliant. So we'll pop the links of those. And I have a website. I can give that as well. Great. So yeah, we'll put your website link below as well. Great. And it- With my Substack, if people enjoy stories about dragons, all subscribers get a free story about dragons set in a magical fantasy world. Perfect. Free dragon story for Substack subscribers. Awesome. Melanie, thank you so much for today. Thank you.